delighted to welcome you to this climate series. I'm Rod Downing from Vancouver, BC, Canada. The overall goal of this series is quite simple. To move the needle from our current destructive patterns to a sustainable flourishing of life for all. It's, if you remember from the civil rights movement, it's an eyes on the prize. We keep going until that goal is achieved. As such, in creating this whole series, we recognize that while solid information is crucial, we need to consider the full dimensions of humanity. Thus, we started earlier with four sessions during the summer and fall, some of which you may have participated in. The idea was that rather than to start with information only, that we start in our heart. A transformative experience is what's needed. How do we properly ground our relationship to nature in a way that truly appreciates the earth and our place within that complex web of dynamics and relations and evokes the appropriate responses of action? So having done that, we turn now to this informational part of the series, where each month during the fall and winter and going out into next summer, we will start with a presentation and Q&A like today. But we will follow it a week later with a discussion session that allows us to deepen the impact and grapple further together we are a relational species, so we'll do it together as we seek that path through all the complexity and our own roles, all of us diverse within that. Yes. Um, so there you have it. The um, session today and the discussions on Thursday, November 19th and Sunday, November 22nd uh, at the times on the screen, depending on your time zone. As well, you can check the website if you forget and also for ongoing actions you can take throughout this series and for the schedule of the series. As well, this uh, series is being archived and this session should be up there uh, definitely within the week. Finally, we are grateful for the GPNW uh, Mission Center for sponsoring this series. Now, a brief in <laughs> introduction of our speaker. When we first envisioned this series, a topic we are all passionate about due to its dire and encompassing nature, it needed nothing but the very best. There is so much at stake. Firstly, it needed a world-class climate scientist to kick things off. And even better would be someone from the IPCC, the UN's Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, that umbrella body for those thousands of scientists that the media always refers to. Though more importantly, it's the people who have spent their entire career working on these issues. And best of all, it should be someone who helped author in 1990, 
that very first of the IPCC every five year reports. For such a person would have over 30 years of watching those ensuing reports and the world reaction to them. And that indeed is who I have the honor of introducing today, uh, Professor Gammon. Dr. Gammon, it, I am indeed thrilled to have you kick off our series with the basic science uh, of climate change. And please note, whoops, I went one too far. Please note that Dr. Gammon will return on January, 20, January 10th of next year to speak on the IPCC recommendations. Plus, at that session on January 10th, he will be joined by President Vizi in a dialogue session. So, wow, that's going to be a session you won't want to miss. Finally, a note to everyone, there will be a Q&A session, a question and answer time afterwards. So please write any questions that you have as they arise uh, in the chat box, preferably directed to the co-host Susie White, though it can be to uh, everyone if you want. And as well, please write down in the chat box or on paper any impactful sentiments that occur so that you can then bring them to the discussion sessions on Thursday and Sunday. So let's go. How about a virtual round of applause for Dr. Gammon while I unshare my screen. Dr. Gammon, the session is yours. Uh, please, uh, <laughs> unlike me, remember to unmute uh, once I unshare my screen, and then you can share your screen whenever you need to. Uh, and it's all yours. Thank you very much for being here and sharing with us. Well, thank you, Rod, for that kind introduction. Uh, I'm honored to have a chance to present the science of climate change to this interesting group of people. Uh, let's uh, see if we can share screen and get my PowerPoint up there. First, let me uh, have to get my PowerPoint on the screen, right? Do I have to leave the meeting to do that? No, maybe not. You should be able just to just click share screen on the bottom there. Yeah. And... Oops. Just a minute. Click share screen on the bottom. All right. That's it. Let's see if this comes up. Okay. I think it's going to work. Whoa, it's going to work. <laughs> I never know. I never know if it's going to work. Okay. Uh, thank you. And thank you, Rod, again. Um, I want to talk to you about the science of climate change. I'll try to make it clear when I'm summarizing <clears throat> the scientific consensus and when I'm giving my own uh, opinion, which might differ from the consensus. Mainly, this is the, I'm going to give the scientific consensus from the global to the Northwest point of view. And uh, on the January 10th session, we can talk more about um, personal or governmental responses to the climate. So this is mainly the climate science, which is pretty grim, uh, <clears throat> but let's go through it. This is my opening slide. And um, the top image is to remind you that the atmosphere is tiny. It's so thin. It's one page in a thousand page book. So when you look up at the sky and think it goes on forever, if you brought the sky down to a layer of constant temperature and pressure, like near the ground, 
it would be one one thousandth of the radius of the Earth. It's tiny. It's tiny. Uh, and the bottom picture, <clears throat> uh, it's a little bit old now, is our grandson, uh, Jesse. And he's on the beach in Southern California. He's a tiny little guy. He's still small. <clears throat> and the point of the figure is that where he's walking will be underwater. One half to one third or more of the beaches of Southern California will be gone before he retires. And that's what we're facing. We'll talk about sea level rise in the Pacific Northwest as well. <clears throat> but I want you to have this image of intergenerational equity and sea level rise as one of the long-term <clears throat> aspects of climate change. OK, here we go. <clears throat> First, as a matter of introduction, I didn't really set out to be a climate scientist. I, I got a, a, a degree in chemistry and a PhD in physical chemistry. And my advisor said, you like chemistry, um, go become an astronomer, become a cosmochemist, an astrochemist. Go study the chemical origins of life in space. So I, I use radio telescopes in the US and in Brazil to study uh, molecules forming uh, in dust clouds around other stars, looking for the chemistry that led to the origin of life uh, and the possibility of life elsewhere. So I was really out there. I was, I was among the stars. Uh, after my experience in Brazil, I felt it was interesting, but I really wanted to do something that would affect the lives of the people. So I, I began to make a transition from um, cosmochemistry, astrochemistry, to stratospheric chemistry. This is the time of the ozone hole in the 70s. And so I became a, a, an atmospheric chemist looking at the, the chemicals that cause the ozone hole, the, the chlorofluorocarbons. <clears throat> and then I followed these gases, the, the freons, as they dissolve in the ocean and became a chemical oceanographer then, following these, uh, these uh, chlorofluorocarbons as tracers of ocean circulation, as they're used to help calibrate ocean climate models. So I really didn't set out to become a climate chemist. And then finally, I had a chance to <clears throat> Uh, direct the U.S. carbon dioxide measurement program, the Mauna Loa CO2 record, South Pole, North Pole. Uh, and that's when I really, uh, in the early 80s, became a climate scientist. And I've never left the carbon cycle or climate change since then. I've <clears throat> continued to do research, direct graduate students. And then in, in my later years, uh, I did a lot of teaching, even freshman chemistry for non-science majors. And I kept bringing up climate change there as well. And now in retirement for the last 10 years, I continue to give public talks on climate change. So in a way, I didn't choose climate change. It's kind of like climate change chose me. It's sort of like a calling and, and I'm, I'm still there. I can't do a lot now, but I can still give public talks and answer questions. So that's, that's the background. That's a little bit about me. Uh, here's where we're going in the talk. <clears throat> I want to first talk about the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, which Rod mentioned. And their first report that I helped co-author was in 1990. They started out about every five years. The second report was 1995, then it slowed down a bit. And the next report was 2001 and then 2007. And the last report was 2013, 14. Um, and they had planned to do another one in 2020, but COVID inter came in between that. And so that's been delayed for a year. So we should have another report from the IPCC, the fifth climate assessment <clears throat> next year. These reports are organized in three parts. The first is the summary of the climate science. The second is uh, impacts and adaptation. And the third is possible policy responses. Those are the, and then sometimes there's a synthesis report of all of that. <clears throat> so that's the way that they've been organized. Who, who gets to write these? Well, governments around the world uh, nominate uh, climate scientists to take part in the IPCC. So they're coming from government, from industry, and from academia. So it truly is an international effort. <clears throat> Now, within the United States, we have something called a National Climate Assessment. By congressional law, every four years, we have to uh, provide, uh, the government, US government provides an assessment of the climate change and climate impacts on the United States. And the last one of these was issued in 2018. So in 2022, there will be another US National Climate Assessment coming. So I will quote some results from the Climate Science Special Report, CSSR, which is chapter one, of the most recent National Climate Assessment. And then finally, here in the Pacific Northwest in Washington State, um, the uh, Washington State Department of Ecology has a lead agency in, in climate assessments for the state of Washington. But uh, Pacific Northwest also has the Climate Impacts Group at the University of Washington. 
And often the climate reports from the climate impacts group on the Pacific Northwest become in fact uh, statements about uh, climate change for the Pacific Northwest and for the state of Washington. And so their reports, I will feature a few of the things that they say. I won't agree with everything that they say, especially uh, concerning sea level rise, as we'll come to that. And then finally, after all this uh, heavy climate science, always we get the questions. Well, what should we do? What should I do? What should the government do? And most of that we're going to leave to the January 10th session, but I'm sure that some of this will come up in the questions. So I'll just preview that and then that, that topic about the uh, policy, policy and personal responses to this climate science uh, will come in, in the January 10th session. <clears throat> so the first thing to say is that uh, 2020 has been a terrible, horrible, no good, very bad year, as Alexander said. So we may in fact, uh, 2020 may break the world record for the warmest year ever. It certainly will probably be the second warmest year. The last five years have been the warmest five years. The last 10 years have been the warmest 10 years. The warmest temperature ever measured on Earth was 130 degrees in Death Valley this year. And in Siberia, first time we've had over 100 degrees Fahrenheit in Siberia this summer, in, in, in Russian Siberia. Um, we've had horrible fires, as you know, uh, throughout the Pacific Northwest, the West Coast, in the Amazon, in Pantanal, in Australia, uh, in many places. And this has led to very bad air quality where Portland, Oregon set the record for the worst air quality in the world for a few days in September. I won't have time to talk about all of these things. Um, one thing that worries me is that the climate sensitivity in some of the re recent climate models may be higher than previous estimates. What is that? It is, okay, you double atmospheric CO2 and let the earth come to new equilibrium. And that new equilibrium for double CO2 is an estimate of the equilibrium climate sensitivity. We thought this was something like one and a half to two or two and a half degrees centigrade for double CO2. <clears throat> some of these new models, not all of them, some of the new models have values as high as three or four or five degrees centigrade for double CO2, which is very worrying. Let's hope that's not, works out not to be the case. Now, in terms of what we can do, there was a report in 2018 comparing the world at 1.5 degrees of warming versus two degrees of warming. Where are we now? We're already at one degree warming, global average. We've already warmed one degree centigrade above the natural pre-industrial world. Uh, meeting the current Paris uh, national uh, uh, determined uh, national uh, climate commitments would leave us at three degrees. And um, we're not on the way to meeting Paris right now. The world is actually heading for four degrees of warming or more. And with the US is actually the first country that has ever withdrawn from this international agreement. Um, President Biden, elect, President-elect Biden has, has guaranteed that the first day in his office, he will rejoin the Paris Accord, which will be effective uh, 30 days after he takes office. Uh, and even then, we'll have to make a new and stronger commitment and try to provide leadership for other countries as we try to head off this, uh, this problem of climate change. Well, one of the worst aspects of this very bad year was the hurricane season. We ran the whole alphabet from A to Z, and we went into the Greek alphabet, and now we're up to iota. So if you care one iota about climate change, you have to be concerned about sea level, uh, 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 sea surface temperature, because most of the greenhouse extra heat is going into the ocean, not more than 90% of it, and warming the ocean. Warm ocean means more evaporation. More evaporation means stronger hurricanes that drop more rain. Maybe not more number of hurricanes, but more strong hurricanes, lasting longer, going further in onshore uh, and, and dropping more rain. So we're up to iota now and the hurricane season not quite over yet. So we've had 30 named tropical storms this year. <clears throat> now, because of COVID, uh, the actual uh, carbon dioxide emissions to the atmosphere are down this year uh, because few pe fewer people are driving, uh, fewer people are flying. And so as a world, we probably dropped 7% this year. And we have been climbing half 1% a year in the previous years. And the point of this is that we actually have to do this every year now. We have to go down 7% per year every year from now for the next 30 years. That's what we have to do if we're going to get to climate neutral, no, green, no net greenhouse gas emissions by 2050. That is a tough call if we can get there. Here's a picture of some of the fires in California and this plume of smoke, the upper right hand picture, the plume of smoke heading, first it went out to the ocean and then it came back and on the westerly winds, 
uh, it headed on across the United States and on to, a on to Europe and over the, over the North Pole and around to Asia. The lower left hand is uh, the town of Paradise, which uh, burned up and killed uh, tens of people, maybe 80 or 90 people uh, two years ago. And then the lower right hand panel shows the plume of smoke from fires <clears throat> in Oregon, Washington, California, out over the ocean before it turned around and was headed eastward on the westerly winds. Um, the upper left hand picture just shows that at one point in September, there were five tropical storms in the Atlantic at the same time. And the lower right hand is Hurricane Zeta, one of the most recent ones uh, coming ashore <clears throat> in uh, New Orleans uh, on, on the Gulf Coast. So as I said, we, we, we've gone through the uh, regular alphabet and we're, we're six or seven letters deep into the Greek alphabet. I hope we don't get to Omega. Um, last year was a terrible fire year in Australia and this year too, and many, many animals were killed. The eucalyptus trees burn very easily. They're like a, a, a tree made of gasoline and the koalas suffered terribly. So billions of animals were killed in fires like the ones in Australia and the fires that are going on now <clears throat> in the Amazon uh, and in the Pantanal. Well, there's some good news. All the nations of the world have reaffirmed their Paris commitments. It's like uh, the national determined contribution. They have to uh, re-up their contribution, try to make a, a tougher goal for themselves. And even China has now said, they're gonna be net zero emissions by 2060. Now 2050 is a goal that we should all shoot for, but China, uh, given its, its population and its commitment, um, maybe they need a little bit longer. Anyway, sometime around the middle of this uh, century in the lifetime of children born today, we will have to have a world which has no net emissions of CO2 and greenhouse gases to the atmosphere. That's a huge goal, but that's where we have to go. Uh, I'm not gonna uh, speak on each of these topics. Again, the whole slideshow will be available to you later to look at. I, I've been told by my students I go too fast, so I'm gonna go pretty fast, but you can look at it later and uh, ask me questions or send me questions. Uh, there's one idea, plant a trillion trees. Yeah, good, great, let's do it. Let's plant a trillion trees, but you know what? Those trees, those little saplings, they're not going to really be taking up carbon from the atmosphere for 10 or 20 years. And they're only going to work if they live. So all those um, afforestation, reforestation, um, only those are good plans. And we need to do it for many reasons, but uh, those trees have to survive if they're going to be a carbon sink. Now, one really good news is that at least in many places in the world, renewable power Electricity generated by wind, solar, and hydro is now generally cheaper than any fossil fuel power. Even running an existing coal-fired power plant costs more than putting up a new wind farm or solar farm. So we see the end of coal, and um, eventually we will see the end of natural gas. And when we have a fully electric transportation system, everyone driving an electric car, not a gasoline internal combustion car or diesel car, then we, will, uh, then we will really make great progress because one third of our emissions are coming from transportation. So let me just, the last point is we need to uh, make our electrical power renewable and then, electro, and then electrify everything, our houses, our cars, et cetera. Um, the upper uh, left-hand picture is the, uh, the actual surface temperature record for the globe. And notice there are five different groups there. And uh, at least by the end of the record, they're in close agreement about the month by month and year by year temperature increase. Um, there was a period after World War II when there was no, essentially no increase, even a slight decrease. Part of that was smog aerosols in the atmosphere. Uh, but since about 1975, it's been almost straight up. And the lower left-hand picture is the Mauna Loa Observatory on the Big Island of Hawaii. Uh, I've been there. Um, it's a beautiful spot. We look over across the valley to Mauna Kea, where the telescopes are. And down in the lower right hand is the actual carbon dioxide record uh, from Mauna Loa. Now, um, Scripps Institute of Oceanography, the record was started by uh, Charles David Keeling in 1958. He had to convince the U.S. Weather Service that he could go to this volcano and begin to collect remote atmospheric CO2 records. At that time, it was not on anybody's radar, really. He was one of the first ones to be concerned about it. Um, and then um, in the late 70s or early 80s, NOAA began to also mon monitor CO2 at the same site. And these two measurements, the Scripps record and the NOAA record, continue side by side, minute by minute, monitoring 
the carbon dioxide ever. The blue, the blue arrow in the early 1980s is when I was in charge of this network. At that time, look at the numbers. It was 340 parts per million, 0.034%. And it was going up about one and a half per year, one and a half parts per million per year. The value now, it's off the scale from off the side for me, is about 415 and it's going up two or three per minute. So half of all the CO2 that we put in the air has been put in the air since 1982, 83, half of it since then. That's what we're doing. So uh, thank you, Dave Keeling and his son, Ralph, who maintains the network today. Um, so here are the three, uh, two of the, sorry, three of the most important climate gases whose concentrations are increasing. The carbon dioxide, we showed you the Mauna Loa record. Um, we have records from the uh, Barrow, Alaska and the South Pole, as well as the Mauna Loa. Notice the methane record, which looked like it was going to level off in the early, uh, late 1990s, and now it's shooting up again. And the nitrous oxide record, which comes largely from uh, nitrate fertilizers on fields, on agricultural use. So all three of these are not stopping. And have you flattened the curve? No. So the, the hard goal is to actually get these emissions to stop going up and then actually uh, have, have constant, uh, have the emissions peak and then have the concentrations peak. So by the middle of this century, we, we would like them no longer to be increasing. Now, it's still up there. It's like garbage in the sky. It's still up there. You have to get it back out. The trees will help, but we're going to have to take it back out by other means. So again, to say this point clearly, the climate models have accurately predicted global warming for the past 70 years, since the 1950s. So the, the models are good. They're excellent. They're getting better. Uh, down in the bottom is a, a conversation that the president had with uh, uh, climate officials and forestry, forest fire people in California. Uh, and the president said, well, it'll start getting cooler. You just watch. And Dr. Crawford said, I wish the science agreed with you, sir. And the president said, well, I don't think science knows, actually. But that's wrong. Science does know. We do know. So I don't want to get political. But I, whenever, whenever um, I feel that the science is attacked, I will respond. The science is not Republican, it's not Democratic. Um, uh, Newton's law of gravity is not political. So the basic science of human caused climate change is not in question, it is not. In fact, more than 97% of the climate scientists say, we know it, it's happening, it's real, and we're doing it. As Kate Marvel, scientist at NASA said, we are more sure that greenhouse gas is causing climate change than we are that smoking causes cancer. Remember, we talked about that one for a long time. And the tobacco industry was fighting with misinformation. Well, there are misinformation, uh, disinformation out there about climate too. But a person is entitled to her own opinions, but not her own facts. Climate change, man-made climate change is now an established fact of climate science, QED. So when I started in 1990, helping to write the carbon cycle chapter, we were way over on the left-hand side of this uh, document, sort of extremely unlikely, very unlikely, unlikely, less likely than not. So the language of that first report was sort of said, well, you know, we think the models are pretty good, but the, the natural variability is so big, it may be a decade or more before we see the signal. That was 1990. By 1995, the statement was stronger. It said more likely than not. In 2001, it said it is likely. And then finally, where we are now, it is extremely likely. 95 to 100% confidence that human influence has been the dominant cause of the warming since the mid 20th century. We're there. We don't get more, more certain than this. That, and this is a very scientifically conservative group. Some people think that IPCC is really not telling the, the scariest part of the science, but sort of a little middle of the road. I think it's pretty accurate. So here's the climate science special report from the National Climate Assessment in 2018. This is the US government report mandated every four years. Uh, again, the Climate Science Special Report is chapter one of that. And uh, our president said, I don't believe it. It's not a belief system. There are things that we can believe, except on faith. Our religious belief is part of that. But science does not require us to believe anything. It says, show me the data. Prove it. So here's some figures from that document. Um, this is the uh, global surface air temperature. And uh, if I would add uh, 2019, 2020, they would just show, look the same way. We just add two more uh, values on, on the right-hand side. Uh, and again, the last five years have been the warmest five years. The last 10 years have been the warmest 10 years. 
we may in fact have all time record this year for temperature. Um, here's a picture of uh, the pattern of global warming um, over the last uh, 50 years. And I want you to notice a few things about this. Um, notice that the warming is greater in the northern hemisphere than the southern hemisphere. That's because there's more land up here, right? And the warming is greater <clears throat> at high latitude than low latitude. That has to do with ice albedo feedback. I can explain that later. And the warming is greater uh, in, uh, on the land than over the ocean. That's because the ocean has greater heat capacity, water does, than, than dirt. The warming is greater <clears throat> in the winter than the summer. And the warming is greater at night than during the day. Only greenhouse gases do that. Not solar variability, not El Nino, nothing else. Only greenhouse gases fit that pattern. And here, here's the figure that shows that. The human caused warming in terms of the forcing or push extra energy captured from the sun compared to solar variability, which is tiny, and volcanic var variability, which is actually negative. When you put volcanic, volcanic dust in the stratosphere, it causes cooling of a half or one degree centigrade uh, for a, a year or two, the lifetime of this volcanic dust in the stratosphere. But notice, overwhelmingly, it's human cause. It is extremely likely that human activity <clears throat> are the dominant cause of the warming since the mid 20th century. There is no convincing alternative explanation. So here's a picture on the left, it shows the actual <clears throat> uh, observed warming and, and, and models. So it's accurately captured in current climate models. And on the right, what would happen if you uh, tried to uh, just let natural variability be there? Take away the greenhouse gases and you see, it doesn't fit the data at all. You've got the volcanoes in there. You've got Agung, you've got El Chichon, Pinatubo, uh, but you don't capture the warming at all unless you have CO2 and the other greenhouse gases in, in the model. Uh, in this figure, um, the upper uh, right-hand figure shows that the warming we're experiencing now is actually greater than any since we came out of the last ice age, 10,000 years ago. That's where we are, where we're going depending upon when we stop putting CO2 in the air, <clears throat> could be warming much, much greater than that. So um, the lower left-hand figure is actually measured data from air, CO2 in air bubbles trapped in ice cores from the South Pole. And as I said, the value today is over 400, maybe 415. And the natural level during warm times, warm interglacial times like we're in, is about 270. And you can see from the figure that during cold ice age times, the value is about 200. So we oscillate between 200 and 270, 200 and 270, as we go through these natural ice age cycles. And we've left that behind. We're now, we're now more than an ice age on the high I side. Uh, so- um, I can't hear us. So. Oh, can you hear? Is it okay? All right. Um, I wanna say that the atmospheric CO2 is now higher than before humans existed as a species. Actually before Neanderthals, before Homo erectus, back three million years ago, shortly after we split off from the chimps, before there were any people, or even in pe uh, pre-human ancestors of the Homo erectus type. That's what we've already done to the atmosphere. Now the climate hasn't quite caught up with that. What was the climate back then, three million years ago? Well, it was two or three degrees warmer, and the oceans were 50 feet higher, 50 feet higher. So watch out, that's in our future. We've already done that to the atmosphere. We just haven't had the warming yet. Here's a figure that shows what the distribution of hot and cold summers would be in the Northern hemisphere when I was a boy, 1950 to 1980, young man, uh, compared to uh, 2005 to 2015, a more recent decade. Notice that the whole pattern distribution has moved to the hot side. Fewer cold days, many more hot days, and many, many more extremely hot days. Is this the new normal? No. It's going to keep moving to the right until we stop putting CO2 in the air. Until we stop the increase in atmospheric CO2, the warming will continue to get hotter and hotter and hotter. So here's a figure from the Climate Science Special Report. Just look at the, uh, the lower panel, the right-hand side. For a high emission scenario that has continued high emissions, we can have warming. As look at the pattern of warming from uh, 14 to 16 degrees Fahrenheit more, we could find 
the Pacific Northwest, somewhere between six or eight degrees Fahrenheit, three to four degrees centigrade warming. Now, it's not, it's not baked in the cake. We don't have to do that, but we have to reduce the emissions to the atmosphere if we want to avoid that. What we've been having is horrible forest fires, especially in the Western US. Hot, dry conditions, drier forests, beetle killed forests, lightning strikes, uh, and, 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 and horrific fires, not just on the West Coast, Colorado as well, throughout the West. And, and what does that mean? Well, okay, here's a figure. This one is sort of says, okay, given a certain amount of warming, what will the rainfall look like? So this is a global picture of how the change in the precipitation will. Notice the dark blue at the high latitude and around Antarctica. So at very high latitude, it's going to precipitate more. Now, most of that precipitation is gonna be coming down as rain, not as snow. Notice the increase in rainfall along the equator and a few places in Africa. But also notice the brown. Notice the brown in the Mediterranean, in Central America, in the Amazon, in Mexico, in, in Southern Chile, in South Africa, and in Australia. So the subtropical regions of the world are predicted to get hotter and drier, hotter and drier. Here's a picture, uh, a NASA uh, uh, estimate of the soil moisture in the year 2020 on the left, left hand panel. And on the, on the right hand panel, it's by 2090. And that dark brown shows uh, an ongoing intense drought throughout our Southwest, Mexico, and Central America. So chronic long duration hydrological drought is increasingly possible before 2100. And the lower panel actually shows uh, the US uh, drought mount monitor for uh, last week or so. Uh, and you can see that the, the desert Southwest is already in drought. And we've been in a, a, a decade long drought in California and the desert Southwest. So um, keep that in mind that hotter, drier conditions, if people can't get water and they can't grow their food, will they stay? No, they'll go, they'll move. They will become climate migrants. Here's a picture of ice at the top of the world. And you can see that the uh, uh, Arctic sea ice, which is floating. So when it melts, it doesn't cause a sea level rise, just like glass and a glass of ice water. When the ice cubes melt, the water level does not change. So floating ice won't do that. However, if you're a, a seal or a polar bear, you rely upon that near shore ice. You, you hunt on the ice. Uh, and when that ice moves far offshore into deep water, um, you either go on shore to get food or you follow the ice out in deep water and there's nothing to eat out there. So ch a, a drastic change in Arctic sea ice. So wh when are we gonna have an ice-free Arctic ocean in the summer? The people I talk to say it might be as soon as 2040, 20 years from now, no ice at the North Pole in the summer. The last time that happened, a million years ago. Here's a, a record through September of 2020, the blue line versus 2012, the previous record holder for low ice. The minimum ice is, is, is mid-September, late September. So we, we, we will be at least uh, second lowest sea ice and perhaps lowest. We'll see how it, how it works out. So half, half the extent of the sea ice is gone and half the thickness is gone. That means three quarters of all the ice is gone now, and it, nothing's gonna bring it back until the planet cools down much more. So in terms of sea level rise, yes, we might just get uh, one, uh, sorry, two or three feet of sea level rise by 2100 in the lifetime of our toddler children and grandchildren today, but we might get six or eight feet. And we can't say that that won't happen. We can say it's not likely, but it's not extreme impossible either. So some people like Eric Renaud thinks that the Western Arctic ice sheet is now unstoppable. We've, we've passed a tipping point. And the Pine Island Glacier and the Thraides Glacier and West Antarctica by, the, by themselves could give us uh, three or four meters of sea level rise, uh, nine or 10 feet. So between, glacier, uh, between uh, Greenland and the Western Antarctic ice sheet, we could looking at, uh, looking at much higher sea level rise. Now, whether that comes uh, by 2100, in the lifetime of our grandchildren or in the lifetime of their grandchildren, it's still our responsibility to try to prevent that from happening. So again, here's uh, the lower figure just to look at that. The high end is eight feet of sea level rise by 2100. A rise of as much as eight feet by 2100 cannot be ruled out. Again, these are, these are not my words. These are the words of the Climate Science Special Report, the last national climate assessment. Yes, we might just get four, but none of those curves are turning over. They're all going up. 
if you look at intergenerational social justice issues, um, our job is to stop, stop that rise. Now, looking here in the Pacific Northwest, uh, the Department of Ecology made this nice figure, said, what are we going to have to look forward to? Uh, we're going to have uh, warmer temperatures, extreme weather events, rising sea level, and reduced snowpack. All of these things are already happening. So as I mentioned, the UW Climate Impacts Group has made nice reports about this. Um, here's a report, Climate Impacts and Adaptation in Washington State. It's a little out of date now, 2013. And on the right-hand side, a little bit later, was uh, 2015, Climate Change in the Puget Sound Region. So these are looking at uh, climate impacts and climate change in the, in the, in the Pacific Northwest region. Um, here's another image of, of the smoke plume from the forest fires last summer. Uh, look at the air pollution index in Portland, upper left-hand panel. Compare it to Beijing and, and New, New York, San Francisco, New Delhi, Portland, off scale. The worst air quality in the whole world for a few days was Portland. And uh, the lower panel shows the fire season, the number of, uh, uh, I think it is acreage burned uh, in 2020 versus previous years. I remember growing up, not growing up here, but um, in, the, in the 70s and 80s here, we had beautiful blue skies in the summer. And now, what's happened to those skies? If we're going to have this smoke, uh, which is a health hazard as well, every summer, I hope not. Uh, ocean acidification, I won't have time to talk about it, but this is a global phenomenon. About a third of the CO2 we burn doesn't stay in the air. It goes into the ocean. It's pushed into the ocean by overpressure of the atmosphere. It's not the biology in the ocean taking it up, not so much. It's more pushed in by the pressure of, of higher CO2 in the atmosphere. And what is it doing? It's making the ocean more acidic. That's the blue curve at the bottom. The acidity of the ocean is increasing. Uh, and it's not good for life in the ocean. Life in the ocean, is, this acidification is growing faster than it has any time uh, since the end of the dinosaurs. I'll skip that panel. It just shows how ocean acidification is happening globally uh, and, and how much the change would be uh, by the end of the century. Uh, the blob as it was called, warm water off our coast. It happened uh, oh, six or seven years ago, and the blob has returned. What happens with the blob? It's bad. It's bad for the fisheries. They don't want the water that warm. It's wonderful if you're toxic algae, demoic acid, toxic algal blooms. It's not good for the uh, shellfish or the, or, or the sea life in the, at all. So um, is this due to climate change? Almost certainly. Um, we grieved when Tahlequah lost her her, her calf uh, two years ago, and she swam around with a dead baby on her head for 10 days with her sisters at her side. She has a new baby now, which we rejoice. And uh, for us, uh, these Southern resident uh, orcas are part of our life and for the native people of this region as well. Um, the numbers are down to about 73 or so. Uh, some new babies have been born this year. We hope they make it. Um, they need salmon, they need king salmon. We should let them have the salmon. If we have to eat pen salmon or East Coast salmon, Norwegian salmon, that's fine. Let's, let's give first crack at the salmon to these, to these, uh, these critters, they need them. Um, other fish have suffered too. Sockeye salmon uh, had a massive kill. More than half the sockeye salmon died before going up the Columbia River because the water was too warm. They couldn't go up. It was just too hot. We, have, uh, we had sea star wasting disease. We're maybe recovering from that now. Um, and we have invasive species like the European green crab. So our, our coastal ecosystems are endangered as well by the changes that are occurring, the temperature and the acidification. So um, someone said, I'm gonna stop in a minute, I'm almost done here. Uh, the oceans are becoming hot, sour, and breathless. Hot because of they're taking up greenhouse heat. Sour, that's ocean acidification. CO2 is a greenhouse gas, it's carbonic acid. And breathless because warmer water holds less oxygen. And I'll add two others, toxic and higher. Higher means the sea level is, is rising, about an inch, a little more than an inch every 10 years now, and accelerating. And toxic because this warm uh, water uh, uh, causes the uh, spread of toxic algal blooms like demoic acid. Now, I love to go to Hawaii and see the fish. Did you know that half the coral reefs are gone already? Half the Great Barrier Reef is gone. And that if we, if we get to two degrees warming, which we may well do, we will lose all the coral reefs in the world, 
And if we just hold the warming to just one and a half degrees, we're only going to lose 75%. I want my grandchildren to snorkel on the reef and see the fish. Bye bye, Nemo. We hardly knew you. So again, here's a possible sea level rise of four feet, but maybe six feet, maybe more. And it's not, because the science is so uncertain, it's not, no reliable probability estimate can be made yet for, for the chance that we'll have a six foot sea level rise. I hate to beat up on our president, but here's something he said that's just wrong, so it has to be countered. To applause, he said, the ocean's gonna rise one eighth, the, one eighth of one inch within the next 250 years. We're all gonna be wiped out, ha, ha, ha. Bad, bad, bad. How high would the sea level go and by when? It's estimated a billion people live within 30 feet of the high tide lines today. And 250 million people live within three feet of sea level. It is projected that as many as 13 million Americans could lose their homes inundated if we have six feet of sea level rise. Two feet, four feet, six feet, and then what? This is an intergenerational ethical issue. Uh, our sea level risk is a, the upper, upper right-hand panel, the size of that uh, dot. Uh, we're about the same risk as California. California says, for planning purposes, consider six feet of sea level rise. Whether you have a managed retreat, whether you affects the real estate values of your beach cottage at the high tide line. We're not as bad as Louisiana, Texas, or Florida, but we're about like California, uh, uh, worse than, than Oregon. We could lose uh, 10,000 people displaced in Washington, even with a three-foot sea level rise. So here is the report from the Climate Impacts Group, Extreme Coastal Water Level in Washington State, and the Guidelines for Mapping Sea Level Inundation in Washington State uh, in uh, October of 1919 by Ian Miller and his colleagues. Now, I've met with them. Uh, I told them that um, I think there are other points of view. I think they, uh, they grossly underestimate the chance of a six-foot sea level rise. Uh, Ian gives the chance is one in a thousand. Others have given this as five percent. So uh, we buy insurance against unlikely events that have high consequences. That's why you insure your house, your car, life insurance, against a low probability, high impact event. Sea level rise is such an event. And other views like the state of California and the Union of Concerned Scientists think that the chances of a high sea level rise on the west coast of the US, British Columbia, Washington, Oregon, California is much greater than one in a thousand. So um, if you can't make a good calculation, you can ask the, the smartest people in the room, in the world. And uh, when this was done by Dr. Bamber's team, they said, well, yeah, if we have high emissions, the chance of a, a two meter sea level rise, that's seven feet, is about 5%, 5%. That's not one in a thousand. 5% is much more than one in a thousand. I was just in a, in a high speed auto crash and uh, I survived, I, I, car was total. I, and the chances of that is one in a thousand for 10 years of driving, but we all drive carefully. But it happened to me, I survived it. But we have to pay attention to things that are 5%. We ought to pay attention to things that are 1%. So again, here's, here's looking at extreme scenarios of up to six, seven, eight feet of sea level rise. It could be less, but again, those curves are all going up. What about our children's 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 children? So here's one of my last slides. Um, it's shown on the left, uh, the, the, the parts that are sort of inked in there will be lost. With six feet of sea level rise, bye-bye. You like to go see the tulips in the Skagit? Bye-bye, they're gone. No more tulips. Cities at risk. Conway, La Conner, Sylvana, Whidbey Island Naval Station, et cetera. So um, yes, you could say, well, it's not gonna happen in my lifetime, I don't care. Well, we have to look to another generation. And then here, again, most of the extreme uh, climate events have been um, elsewhere in the US. We, we haven't had that many. We don't have hurricanes, really. We, we could have um, earthquakes. Uh, we have some volcanoes, <clears throat> but we don't have uh, the hurricanes. But those people elsewhere in the US, where are they going to go? Here's one economic study that looks uh, at county by county. And the red counties are losing economically because of climate change. And the green areas are going to benefit economically. One study said that half of the people in the lower half of the United States will move 
even if you just take 10% of the lower population of the US, that's gonna be 15 million people. That's the largest migration in the history of the US. Much more than Okies in the Dust Bowl, much more than blacks coming from the South to the North uh, in this uh, last century. So 15 million people, maybe 5 million more to the Pacific Northwest. Hey, why not? It's a good place. Are we, are we, are we preparing for, for accepting those climate refugees? So um, Dr. Holdren, a presidential science advisor under Obama said, our choices are three. We can mitigate, adapt, and suffer. If we mitigate, try to avoid the change to which we cannot adapt, like five degrees of warming. Adapt, prepare for the warming we can no longer avoid. We're gonna have one and a half or two degrees. Know what? Prepare for that. And then minimize human suffrage, human suffering and damage to the natural world. As Kate Marvel said again, climate change isn't a cliff we fall off, but a slope that we slide down. Every bit makes it worse. No matter how far down the slope we go, there's never reason to give up fighting. Two degrees is better than three degrees. Three degrees is better than four degrees. Four degrees is better than five degrees. Stop it where we can. We can't stop it completely, but we can slow it down and stop the worst. So the top picture shows who's burning the fossil fuel, the developed world, and the bottom picture shows who's going to suffer the most. South America, Africa, India. So there's a great social injustice here. The people who have benefited the most from burning coal, oil, and natural gas are not the ones who are going to suffer the most. The people coughing in wood smoke around the campfire in Central Africa will suffer more than we will. Here's an example. Uh, by changes in weather of uh, rainfall and drought, uh, plagues of locusts are eating crops in East Africa, leading to widespread crop failure, hunger, and famine emerging now. So uh, this is our fault. We need to help them. There's the Climate Vulnerability Index. You notice that, there, again, the greatest risk is for those the least responsible for causing the climate change. And then, um, as uh, author Wallace Wells has pointed out, in some parts of the world are not just going to be uncomfortable, they're going to be uninhabitable. You can't live there. You can't grow your food. You can't get water. Where are these people going to go? Tens, probably hundreds of millions of people. What walls are going to keep them out? Notice uh, Central America. Notice the Amazon. Notice Africa. Notice India. What walls are going to keep them out? People are going to move. They're going to move for their children's sake. Yes, China is now past us for emissions. But if you say what's causing the climate change is not what China is doing now, it's the total amount of CO2 that any country has ever put up. So start at the Industrial Revolution, add it all up. It's most of it's still up there in the air, garbage in the sky. We are number one. We're number one in emissions per person, cumulative. So we, are, we're, we bear the greatest responsibility for the climate change, which is happening now. What do we have to do? Well, if you want to get back to zero, or below zero, you've got to stop the emissions now. We've got to peak the emissions and then start down. Now, I don't think we're actually going to stop at 1.5. I'd love it if we could stop at two. I, I think we're going to go to three or four. I hope we don't go to five or six. If we continue emitting without stopping, we can go to a much, much warmer world. So this is almost my last slide. The red curve shows what we have to do. Between now, 2020, and 2030, cut it in half. That's 7% a year. And then between 2030 and 2040, cut that in half. That's another 7% per year for another 10 years. And then between 2040 and 2050, cut that in half. That's another 7% per year. 7% per year reduction from now till 2050 would get us 90% of the way down. How do we get the rest? Stop all tropical deforestation, massive program of afforestation and reforestation, and direct removal of CO2. That's not just the tree planting. That means direct air capture. We capture CO2 and we put it safely back underground. It's underground for a reason. Okay, I'm finished. Let the people know the facts, said Abraham Lincoln, and the country will be safe. So here, here's me up here blabbing away about green jobs, livable cities, renewables, and there's a guy in the back saying, what if it's all a big hoax and we create a better world and it's all for nothing? Let's do it anyway. Let's create a better world. So as Kathleen Dean Moore said, Knowing all this, how then shall we live? Naomi Klein's book is, This Changes Everything. And as Yogi said, it's getting late a lot earlier now. And as Wallace Stevens said, after the final no, there comes a yes. 
And on this, yes, the future world depends. Wendell Berry said it very well. Whether we or our politicians know it or not, nature, nature is party to all of our deals and decisions. She has more votes, a longer memory, and a sterner sense of justice than we do. I won't read these. I'll stop there. Thank you very much. All right. Well, everybody catch your breath. Take a deep, cleansing breath while the air quality is still good. And I'll just add one more quote, uh, Dr. Gammon. Um, uh, Van Morrison said, it doesn't matter to which God you pray, precious time is slipping away. That's good. You can add that to your list of quotes if you'd like. Uh, thank you so very much uh, for the presentation. Um, my name is Dean White, and I'm now going to be moderating a period of questions. And I think we have until uh, just about uh, um, uh, 3 30, I believe, is our ending time. Am I correct on that, Ron? You're muted. Uh, yes. Uh, With a few uh, minutes to for, close. Formal ending maybe at. Uh, 3, 15, 20, and then if people still have other questions, uh, okay. we can linger. All right. uh, but we can go to 320 for sure, and then Great. Uh, dribble on okay. after that. All right. Well, so I'm going to start now, um, um, Professor Gammon, uh, with, us, uh, with some questions. Um, and first of all, um, you, you, know, you mentioned in one of your slides the uh, the three gases um, that are greenhouse gases, uh, one is CO2, of course, then methane and nitrous oxide. Um, how should we value those in terms of their importance for us to uh, address with, uh, uh, in some way, trying to uh, reduce those gases? Which, which has the greatest importance? Thank you for the question. Um, most of the warming is due to carbon dioxide, but probably two thirds of it. Um, on a per molecule basis, methane uh, is much more potent uh, and nitrous oxide even, even much more potent than that. And, and the chlorofluorocarbons or the hydrofluorocarbons even more, maybe a thousand times more important per molecule than CO2, but there's, the concentration is much lower. One thing to say is that um, some of these gases like methane actually only last 10 years in the atmosphere. And uh, along with soot, uh, these are called short-lived climate forcing gases. If we go after methane and soot, we can make a big, we can at least get 10 or 15% of the problem out of the way. Uh, nitrous oxide is probably 100 times more potent than CO2, but again, its concentration is very low. If we change our agricultural practices, more uh, nitrogen fixing um, plants that we eat, uh, a more careful use of ammonium nitrate fertilizer, uh, we can probably reduce the uh, laughing gas, it's called, nitrous oxide concentration quite a bit. So we can do a lot with these non-CO2 greenhouse gases, and especially the short-lived ones, there's something called the global warming potential. So all of these gases can be compared on a 100-year basis with carbon dioxide. And that's, that's how we make the equivalence between uh, other gases and their heat-trapping abilities and CO2. Hey, thank you. Um, so I have a question. Um, I think uh, there was a documentary called Kiss the Ground, as I recall. Um, which talks about um, our needing to heal our soil along with planting trees. Um, do you know what that's referring to? Is that some, a topic that's familiar to you in terms of how we, uh, how we heal our soil? And I, did, I did not see the show. I did not see the show, but you can say that uh, since the beginning of agriculture, most of our agricultural practices reduce the carbon in soils. So we need to reverse that and begin to put carbon back into soils. Yes. And, uh, and, um, by, by certain intercropping and planting and, and, and uh, fallow grasses, not plowing so much, no plow agriculture, uh, intercropping, there are a number of, of, of ways that we can uh, begin to put carbon back into the soil. Now, is this gonna solve the problem? No, is an important part, along with growing trees, putting trees back on the land, stopping deforestation. All of these I see as sort of 10 or 20% effects. The most important thing is to, um, Stop burning fossil fuels, coal, oil, and natural gas. Put a price on carbon. I've seen reference, um, you know, in the sort of the, the popular culture to uh, the notion that 
gosh, they're going to take away our hamburgers. They're going to make us stop eating meat and so on. But how important is um, a plant-based diet uh, rather than a, um, a meat-based diet to uh, helping us begin to adapt our, our cultural practices? The numbers that I've seen uh, that agriculture today, food and agriculture, is about 15 or 20 percent compared to the total budget. Now, if we get the, the transportation emissions down uh, and the electricity from renewables, then the fraction that food and agriculture represents will go up, maybe a third, maybe more. So yes, uh, I would say uh, my, my wife is a carnivore. I'm the cook. Uh, I try to, we try to eat less red meat, more fish and chicken. Uh, Red meat it becomes a luxury. Uh, we love lamb, especially. <laughs> uh, but uh, you can eat red meat less often. You don't have to become a vegetarian. Yes, if, if the whole world went vegetarian, that'd be great. But don't, don't try to guilt trip people to do that. We don't have to go that far. People, people can reduce their food waste a lot. Don't just throw stuff out. Reuse it. Find creative ways to, to recook and reuse stuff. Uh, and then, uh, as I said, uh, Grow some of your own food. If you've got a, even, even some herbs in your windowsill, everybody can grow a little bit of their own food. That helps too. You mentioned uh, carbon capture in one of your last slides. Um, can you give us a sense of, of where technology is and, and um, uh, in terms of carbon capture uh, and whether it's scalable at this point to a level that would uh, make a difference? I think that carbon capture is maybe one area where uh, the two parties in this country uh, might find some common ground. Uh, it's, right now, it's free. It's free to put carbon dioxide in the air. So actually, uh, as I said, it's like garbage, garbage in the sky. If you sort of take a bag, a bag of dog feces and throw it over the fence in your neighbor's yard, after a while, he's going to call public health on you. And they're going to come and say, you can't do that anymore. And oh, by the way, uh, you have to uh, pay to clean up your neighbor's yard. So we're going to have to stop putting CO2 in the air, and we're going to have to take it back out. And one way to take it back out is direct air capture. So you, you, you have air, uh, in, even in a remote place, air move over a, a filter that is alkaline and captures acid gases, CO2, and then you scrub the CO2 off the filter, compress it, and put it safely underground in a geological formation, like a basalt formation. So uh, Iceland would be a great place to do this. Now, is it free? No. Can it be done for $50 a ton? Maybe not. Can it be done for $100 a ton? Yes, David Keith at Harvard. And a, there are two or three groups that think they can do this now with a price of carbon in the range of, of $100 a ton. So that's probably where we're going to have to go. It's not free. Actually, it's cheaper than what you pay for garbage collection today. If, at the same cost that you pay for garbage disposal at your house, uh, we can take carbon out of the atmosphere. You, uh, you've mentioned um, the importance of tree planting and reforestation, but of course that those trees have to live long enough to make a difference. Uh, you, and you also mentioned that uh, countries are in, by and large, uh, continuing to at least formally subscribe to the Paris Accord. Um, but given the, the uh, deforestation occurring in Brazil, what's your assessment of of what's going on now currently in Brazil, given the, uh, the government um, in Brazil and its uh, tendency to disregard the importance of the Amazon. Um, I know it's a political question rather than a scientific one, but I'm just curious. Yes, uh, my, my wife and I lived in Brazil for two years during the di dictatorship uh, in 1974 to 76. Uh, and uh, this fellow, this Bolsonaro guy, he is an autocrat. He's a dictator. Uh, and he's a great threat to democracy in Brazil and to science in Brazil. So I'm afraid that uh, we have to hope that the Brazilians will have a change of government and return to a more democratic form of government and a better protection of the Amazon and the native people who live in the Amazon. So uh, now, what can other countries do? We can pay, if we trust them, we can pay Brazil not to cut down the trees. We can pay to protect the Amazon. Uh, and, and I think that uh, when, when we, through international organizations, I think that we have to begin to offer financial incentives to indigenous people and people in the forest 
to protect the trees. They, they want to live with the trees in the forest. They don't want to knock them down. A lot, of the, a lot of the forest fires now are in the Pantanal, sort of a wetland agricultural area south of the Amazon. And I've been there too and seen the jaguars. It's a beautiful place. And it, it hurts me so much to know that one quarter of it burned up this year. But yeah, this guy Bolsonaro is, is a jerk. And his son is, is a very corrupt regime. Uh, uh, now, when I lived there, they said, what they say in Portuguese, a floresta é nossa. This, this Amazon forest, it's ours. It's our forest. Don't tell us what to do with our forest. But I think the rest of the world can say, listen, we'll pay you not to knock down the forest. So you've talked about the importance, obviously, of renewable technologies for generating our electricity. We had a period during um, um, our U.S. history and also around the world of uh, increasing reliance on nuclear energy. Uh, what are your views about nuclear energy as an option and uh, the consequences of using nuclear? Yeah, I'm, I'm often asked this question by environmental groups and, and they're often split pro and anti-nuclear. My own view is that uh, nuclear provides a uh, baseload electricity now. It's, part, it's like, like a battery and I think eventually maybe we'll have better batteries for solar and wind, but I would keep existing nuclear plants going that can operate safely. Nuclear waste is a problem, proliferation is a problem, uh, I, I think that the government should continue to offer research for small, modular, next generation nuclear. And uh, um, uh, Bill Gates is, is in favor of this. There are a number of uh, research projects going forward for small, modular nuclears. Maybe that's the solution. I would put some money into research for that and I would not shut down existing nuclear power plants. I don't think nuclear is gonna grow the way solar and wind is gonna grow. But right now, like hydro, it's part of the base load and it does not put CO2 in the air. And then there's another question about another alternative. Uh, could seawater hydrogen be part of the solution uh, for heating homes and powering uh, large machinery and vehicles? Um, I'm, I'm not familiar with, with uh, the uses of hydrogen. Uh, do you have a sense about what that option might entail? Well, I just bought another electric car, Chevy Bolt, uh, and I plug it in and I have solar panels on my roof. And so I, I think that, um, Electric vehicles from solar power and wind uh, have the lead on hydrogen. I think that, quote, green hydrogen is certainly worth pursuing. And uh, if we can uh, run airplanes on green hydrogen or ships on green hydrogen, it's a great idea. The way you make hydrogen is you take water and you electrolyze it. You split it up. You have to put energy into it to break the hydrogen-oxygen bond and get hydrogen back from water. Right now, we're getting it by, 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 uh, from methane. Don't do that. So yes, if we can get hydrogen cleanly by using electricity that we generate some other way uh, and store that hydrogen, it's, it's very bulky and it takes up a lot of space, uh, but it has great energy capacity and all you get out at the other end of the tailpipe is water. And the amount of water in the air is determined by the temperature of the ocean, QED, done. So yes, green hydrogen has a potentially great future. I don't see a lot of filling stations around the United States uh, selling hydrogen. I do see a lot of, a lot of, a lot of charging stations. Got it. Okay. Um, so, you know, I think we've, um, from the slides that you've presented, had the impression that um, this change, uh, while steady and increasing, is relatively gradual. Um, but do you foresee tipping points? Um, I've read about, for example, a, a tipping point relative to the Gulf, uh, uh, Gulf Stream and whether a sudden dramatic change might result uh, from just a certain point in which temperature rise occurs. What's your notion about uh, sort of this, the, um, the slope of that curve in terms of catastrophic events or whether, uh, whether it will, will see a sudden kind of an event perhaps in terms of weather patterns occur? I think that, uh, I think there are tipping points in the system. I think the climate models are not very good at finding those. I like the quote that I gave from Kate Marble that it's more like a slippery slope than a tipping point. And we have to stop it wherever we can. Uh, but yes, I think that for example, um, destabilizing the Greenland ice sheet or West Antarctic ice sheet uh, may have already begun. And no matter what we can do, uh, we can't stop that. Maybe uh, we're gonna lose the Arctic ice pack no matter what we do. Uh, and these, these are things that don't come back right away. In fact, the, the, the chemistry of the ocean the natural cycle to restore the alkalinity of the ocean 
is not a hundred or a thousand, it's 10,000, 30,000 years. So as somebody said, what we do in the next 10 years will determine the future of the planet for the next 10,000 years. So yes, we have to act quickly. But, and yes, most of the changes look like they're pretty continuous, but although I would say suddenly we're in a different fire regime. Suddenly we're in a different hurricane regime. So things are happening, not snap on and off, but suddenly accelerating in a way that we, that we didn't foresee. Now, now what about um, ocean waves and tidal power uh, as a potential source of uh, electrical generation? Uh, do you have any sense about the scalability and the feasibility of those kinds of options? I think those are uh, like Bay of Fundy, they're niche operations. I think that's gonna represent a small, small local source of power for some people. I don't see it even as a five or 10% solution to the global energy problem. But yes, where we can do that, like geothermal. Places, we should tap geothermal more than we do. Uh, uh, hydro, in certain places, hydro will increase. A lot of places, hydro will go down as the flow of, of water goes down. But yes, I, any place where we can, can, can tap other sources of energy, we should. And of course, energy conservation efficiency is the best new source of power. So we've talked a lot about um, technology and um, ways of converting our uh, energy sources uh, through technology. Um, but there's also the notion that our lifestyles uh, continue to have a greater and greater impact. Uh, sort of the consumerism of American culture. You've talked about how much, you know, the Northern Hemisphere countries, uh, the, the uh, countries that have the, the perhaps the the most uh, enriched lifestyles and a heavy consumer orientation uh, uh, have a, a, the, the impact that has then caused the suffering in, the, in those uh, countries that are in the Southern Hemisphere. What's your view on how we might need to change as consumers of resources and, and products that we're, we've gotten so used to? Uh, I'll just say a few words because I hope that we'll come back to this in January as another topic. But I would certainly say that uh, uh, we have to, each of us, uh, individually and in our families, look at our, uh, our carbon footprint and try to reduce it. So uh, as an example, here on Whidbey Island, we followed uh, Jefferson County uh, uh, in doing a, a, a community experiment where we had teams of people, we had about 50 or 60 people in teams, uh, try to reduce their carbon footprint. First they have, you can't manage what you don't measure. So the first thing for the first month of data, we had all these families and individuals monitor their carbon use and, and keep a record of it. And then for the next two months, we had them reduce, consciously reduce their carbon emissions. And at the end, we gave away bottles of wine and prizes for those who had reduced their emissions the most. And uh, the average was 30% reduction in the carbon footprint of those 60 or 70 people who took part in this uh, three month experiment. So here in Washington state, of course, uh, I think we were proud that our governor, uh, when the, when the uh, primary season was going on, uh, really elevated climate change as the most uh, sort of fundamental issue. Um, but that it, it doesn't seem to be quite as much in the fore uh, now that we're moving into the uh, period of a transition of administrations. Um, do you, do you feel that there is, um, that it's gonna be possible to re-energize the climate uh, issue as the core central issue uh, in our national decision-making? Or and if so, or if, if not, what would it take to make that happen? I'm, I'm, uh, I'm hopeful, I'm optimistic that the Biden administration will put climate on the front burner. I think that Obama in the beginning, he had two issues. One was healthcare and one was climate. And uh, he, he went with health care and, and we got the, we got the, uh, the, the Obama Health Care Act, but we didn't get the climate. So, uh, and I think that Biden will move on both uh, improving the health care as well as a really, a really forward position on, on climate change. And yes, I think that Jay Inslee's uh, contribution to the Obama agenda is very great. I, I, I actually hope that uh, Jay stays in the state and doesn't go to the federal government but uh, he certainly has made a contribution by, put, by defining very clearly what we need to do. So if we were to look to other countries in the world as role models for 
uh, ourselves here in the United States and Canada, particularly, I know we have someone from England on the call as well, but are there role model countries that, that you would point to who seem to be doing um, a good job of addressing um, the challenge of climate change? Well, our neighbor to the north right here in British Columbia has a carbon tax and they've had it for 10 years, right, or more. And it has helped reduce their emissions, at least relative to the rest of Canada. And so, uh, yes, we need a carbon tax here. So I would start with that. If you look at the average uh, per person emissions in Western Europe, it's half, half of the emissions of the United States. Half. Yeah. So I know you've been active um, just in your own community on uh, Whidbey Island um, in, uh, as part of groups, I think, that have been trying to influence local government on changes. Can you talk a little bit about your experience um, uh, with groups uh, just in Island County, uh, for example, and what you've um, managed to um, support them doing um, toward these issues? Well, I think that here very locally, Langley City Council has been quite active through Peter Morton, and uh, they're looking at sea level rise and, uh, as a function of, as a need for their city planners. I think this effort to do the uh, uh, taming Bigfoot, your carbon footprint, was an effort largely South Whidbey. We had a few people from Oak Harbor, but we were following what Jefferson County had done earlier. And I would encourage other communities to make this effort to have people measure and then reduce their carbon footprint. I think that locally in the community, that's a really useful thing to do. I think I've also joined uh, and uh, often attend, but not every time, the Citizens Climate Lobby here uh, on the island. They, they meet up uh, north of uh, Coopville uh, once a month. Uh, and that's a national, international organization trying to get uh, a, a price on carbon uh, in, uh, in our, in our uh, national legislature. All right. Um, I think we're just at now 320. Um, and so I think I'm going to uh, close off. We've got the promise of our January conversation and the notion that we, uh, we can move more into the topic of, of you know, what can we do? Um, so Dr. Gammon, I want to thank you for your presentation today. It was just a privilege to gain uh, the, many of the insights from your decades of study uh, being at the, at the forefront of this critical issue. I'm sorry that it went by so fast, but as I promised uh, Rod, we will have the, the full uh, slideshow available to people to look at at, at their leisure. That's, that's terrific. Um, so I want to remind people now that as a follow-on to uh, this presentation um, on uh, this is coming week, November 19th at 6 p.m., we're going to have a conversation session. Uh, and then uh, for those who can't do that one on November 22nd at 2 p.m., these are online conversations reflecting on Dr. Gammon's presentation and particularly on our response as a faith community. Um, and so please, if you haven't already, make a note of the uh, takeaways that you have uh, from this session. Bring those to uh, whichever conversation you participate in, and um, we'll be using that, um, your contributions in that way to um, our further discussions about how we might move forward. And as a, as a reminder, um, We've set our sights on building a bridge to the future of our earth that's reflected in the following verse from the poem we read in our previous conversation. The only way off the crumbling cliff is to build this bridge. As you go, go every day to the edge of what you know of yourself and then go beyond. There you will find others singing a familiar song, becoming a new way together. There will be no name for this new place until long after we are gone, but you feel it calling, praying you into being. Go fly, do it now. I will join you. Brad, any final remarks? Um, just again, uh, thank you to Dr. Gammon uh, for uh, 
your years of expertise and your clarity on the both the seriousness of the issue and also those hopeful signals that you sent out. Um, we very much look, I am very much looking forward to the January session. Um, and for everybody, uh, yes, uh, Dr. Gammon will be providing me with the actual PowerPoint and we will have an archive of this uh, entire uh, basically video of it up on the website uh, within a few days uh, because yes, he does go pretty quickly through some things and you might want to you might want to soak that in a little more because boy, there was a lot of stuff uh, that he presented. So uh, thank you very much, Mr. Uh, Dr. Gammon. Thank you. thank you very much, everybody else uh, for joining us and uh, hope to see you either the Thursday or the uh, Sunday. And definitely uh, we won't be doing a, a session over December simply because Christmas, too busy, too crazy but we will be starting, boom, January the 10th and going through uh, that, going through to the summer. And uh, take a look at those topics, uh, migra you know, migration and issues around that. We'll be dealing with biodiversity, we'll be dealing with issues like that, and also even issues of psychology, um, because that's part of of how do you spread the word? How do you get the political uh, constituency and things like that? So each month we will be having a separate expert uh, in that field. So stay tuned, we're just starting. And the whole thing, as I said, is to move that needle uh, more towards that sustainable world that we want and that Dr. Gammon has given us hints we can get to, and that that poem uh, just gives you that heart sense of things. So thank you very much, everybody. Have a good day.